TAD is the underlying condition for the three acute coronary syndrome. So let's begin here. So this is no different from we learn in heart failure or fourth semester. So um, atherosclerosis is the narrowing of the blood vessels, right? Specifically the arteries. And then of course, this is the root cause. Uh, risk factor for CAD includes metabolic syndrome, which is the four characteristics, abdominal obesity, uh, high cholesterol, actually five. So abdominal obesity, um, high cholesterol, high triglyceride, pre-diabetes, hypertension. Okay. So specifically, this chapter will talk about coronary problems. So this is not any different from the vascular disorders, uh, the root cause of vascular disorders, specifically peripheral artery disease. And this is also the same for hypertension. So it's the same concept. So they all have the same risk factor, atherosclerosis. So here's the problem with uh, artery disorders. So the, these are the layers of your artery. And then uh, with the risk factors again of metabolic syndrome, uh, sedentary lifestyle, smoking, whatever your risk factors are. The plaque formation doesn't occur on the endothelium. So if you look at the layers of the artery, the plaque forms underneath the endothelium. It's, it's between the endothelial layer and the media layer. Okay? The, the, it's around the intima uh, layer. And of course, when plaque deposits increase or enlarge, that weakens the integrity of the endothelium because now it's lifted up off the muscle, right? If you look at the diagram, the larger the, the plaque deposit, which is caused by atherosclerosis, it weakens the, the integrity of the endothelium because it's no longer adhered to the intima, to the, to the media, to the muscle of, of the artery. So as a result, a weakened endothelium, because what will happen to the blood pressure here now, if you narrow the, the lumen of the artery, okay, the blood pressure will what? The pressure, pressure will increase. So if you add high blood pressure plus a weakened endothelium, what will happen to the surface of this endothelium? It will rupture. Once it ruptures, now the wall is no longer smooth. What will plate that's do? When they, when they circulate and reach these ruptured places, they will stick to the ruptured layer of the endothelium. As a result, you have a clot and a clot in a few seconds will form totally obstructing the coronary vessel, coronary artery, then you have a heart attack. <coughs> Any question? All right. So here are the coronary blood vessels. As you can see, the coronary sinuses are at the base of the, of the aorta, right? So that's where they form. So therefore, that's why, when do the coronary vessels perfuse? Which part of the cardiac cycle? Is it, do they perfuse during systole or asystole uh, or tor during the diastole? The diastole. So when the ventricles are relaxed, as blood falls back on the aorta, they fill the coronary arteries, right? All right, the manifestations of acute coronary syndrome, uh, let's start first with angina. Now, angina pectoris is not one of the three acute coronary syndromes. So the three acute coronary syndromes are unstable angina. We have non-ST elevation MI, and then we have ST elevation MI. So angina pectoris is also known as chronic stable angina. So no matter which term you want, to call, you want to use, they mean the same thing. Angina pectoris is the same as chronic stable angina. Let me emphasize again, this is not one of the 
coronary acute coronary syndromes. Okay, this is not a heart attack. The patient though has coronary artery disease, meaning they have atherosclerosis. So one or more of the coronary arteries already have plaque formation. All right. And then once you have these symptoms, let's say the patient has chest pain, which is uh, the hallmark sign of angina pectoris. However, the chest pain here is always precipitated by an event. So that event can be physical, could be environmental, could be emotional. Anything that increases myocardial oxygen demand with a coronary vessel already partially blocked. So let's say you have CAD, right? Meaning one or more of your arteries look like this, right? You will be diagnosed with not only coronary artery disease, but also with angina pectoris once you start complaining of chest pain. Let me emphasize again, in this condition, in angina pectoris, the chest pain episode is always preceded by some event that increases your heart rate. So whether that event is, let's say you're shoveling snow, you're having sex, you're eating, you are running up the stairs, or you won the lottery, or you got divorced, or you got married. Okay, so any event could be happy and ha a happy event. It could be also a sad event, right? So anything that causes, because what happens to oxygen demand by the myocardium when your heart rate increases? It increases myocardial oxygen demand. Now, is the demand going to be met if your arteries, your coronary arteries look like this? No. So therefore, what will happen? Ischemia happens, right? Then that ischemia, what is ischemia again? Lack or low blood flow to a tissue or organ that causes chest pain. Do you understand? All right. So that's the nature of angina pectoris. So when you have this diagnosis, you have an ischemic episode. Again, it's always preceded by an event, right? Meaning... Unlike acute coronary syndromes, when we go to later, there is no event precipitating the or preceding the chest pain, right? So for angina pectoris, of course, this is always preceded by an event. The patient was doing something or something happened to the patient prior to the chest pain episode. Another characteristic of this is the since the ischemic event, the lack of blood flow was not permanent, meaning this is not caused by a blood clot. Unlike a heart attack where it was a clot, it was blocked by a blood clot, which caused the ischemia, and therefore there will be death of the myocardial tissue. Here, there's none. There is no blood clot formation, and the the uh, ischemic episode was not long enough to cause death, right? And this is going to be repeated. Okay, so the next time, let's say the patient shovels snow or the next time they run up the stairs, next time they had sex or next time they had a uh, uh, any other uh, event that causes increased heart rate, include, including, let's say, they're smoking, for instance, so that still lowers oxygen, right? So and increases your heart rate, therefore. So it, it repeats itself. Also, and then the patient notices that there's a pattern here. So every time I do something, like run up the stairs, I have chest pain, right? And the char another characteristic is it's relieved by either rest or if the patient is already diagnosed with this condition, they will likely be given a, a short-acting vasodilator, such as nitroglycerin. Okay, so you read the your patient's chart uh, earlier, uh, Mr. Carl Shapiro. So he was prescribed with nitroglycerin, right? So we have... Uh, short-acting nitroglycerin in a spray or a sublingual injection, I mean sublingual tablet, sorry, uh, or it could also be uh, a patch, okay? Mm -hmm. So again, in angina pectoris, there is no permanent obstruction of blood flow. It's just a temporary obstruction caused usually by Basospasm, okay, meaning because your heart rate increased, oh, there was an imbalance between oxygen supply and demand because your your arteries, coronary arteries are narrowed because you have coronary artery disease. Any question on 
uh, and down at the torus. All right. Risk factors again is metabolic syndrome. I already named the five characteristics of uh, metabolic syndrome. So here it is, uh, one, two, three, four, and there should be a fifth one right there, All right? So those are your five uh, risk factors that mean you have coronary syndromes. Do you need help identifying? Th these are the bullet points, okay? So if we have one or more of these five, one, two, three, four, and then number five, you have metabolic syndrome, right? Okay. And here are other risk factors, chart 23-1 for CAD. We always focus on CAD because this is the root cause of uh, acute coronary syndromes, including uh, also um, heart failure or peripheral artery disease, stroke, uh, same thing. And here are your non-modifiable as well as your modifiable risk factors. Prevention, of course, is if you look at the five characteristics of metabolic syndrome, those are what you can control. So if you're diabetic, manage your diabetes well. If you have high cholesterol or have obesity, then lose weight, eat healthier. If you don't smoke, then start smoking. Okay. <laughs> it's never too late to start. Okay, for dietary measures, you remember the DASH diet? Okay, so same thing here. They'll talk about the DASH diet and emphasis on blood glucose control for diabetics as well as uh, moderate alcohol consumption, smoking cessation, losing weight, becoming more active. Okay, so for medications, since the root cause of CAD is atherosclerosis, so part of the therapy will always include statins. Okay, so like lipid lowering medications. Uh, you discussed this already previously under hypertension, so I won't repeat that. Here's smoking cessation. Here are the medications for atherosclerosis. Uh, as far as statin goes, we have different types of statins. So for patients who cannot tolerate or have contraindications for statins, including uh, liver disease, then there are non-statin options here. We have phenofibrate and gemfibrozil. However, data suggests, and the American Heart Association will also state that uh, the highly recommended medications are really the statins because there, there's no other drug that provides as, as good as uh, statins as far as cardio protection is concerned. They really have the uh, best cardiac uh, protection uh, with statins. Okay. But again, if we can't, we, we can't take statins, then these are your uh, options. There are also here, also non-statin options. Uh, cholesteramine is very popular. So this is like a, uh, well, you, you drink it, <clears throat> it's a powder, you dissolve it. And what it does is it, it uh, lets you uh, get rid of fat through your stools. Okay, so it's, it's like a laxative, but um, this is really the purpose. But uh, some people do use it as a laxative as well, and you lose weight at the same time. Here's hypertension. Again, this is one of the five metabolic syndromes. And diabetes, as I already mentioned. Uh, some, this, this, section of the chapter uh, talks about the non-modifiable uh, risk factors now. So we got gender, we have uh, ethnicity, uh, race. As already described, angina torus is a syndrome wherein the patient has chest pain. Now this chest pain again is precipitated by what? Okay, so in response to physical exertion or emotional stress, again, 
the stressor here doesn't have to be unpleasant. Okay, it could also be a pleasant stressor, right? Such as you winning the one billion on the lottery. Okay, so make sure you don't have CAD because you might die, right? And then never get to enjoy the billion. I already described that there is what happens again when you or your heart when you have physical exertion exertion or emotional stress. What happens to your heart rate? Increases and what happens to myocardial oxygen demand? Increase. And whenever you have CAD already occurring, plus you have increased myocardial oxygen demand, what happens? It's an imbalance, right? So the, your uh, narrowed coronary arteries cannot meet that increased oxygen demand. Hence the ischemia manifested by chest pain. Other stressors are exposure to cold. Okay, so I described earlier two, right? So when you shovel snow, you have both there. You have physical exertion plus cold weather, all contributing to vasoconstriction. <clears throat> Doesn't help the condition. So you get the chest pain episode. Also after a heavy meal, because what happens to your blood flow after a meal? Where do they go? Goes to the GI tract, right? Our sympathetic system, <clears throat> then it it um, deprives your vital organs with uh, oxygen flow. Uh, emphasis on a heavy meal, though. So it doesn't mean like after every meal, okay, that you, you have chest pain, not really. It's after a heavy meal. We're not testing the types of angina because all of these are <coughs> chest pains. Okay? No matter what type of angina, they just differ in what caused the angina, right? But they all, all angina are chest pain episodes. There are other manifestations that usually accompany the chest pain here. Uh, these are the other symptoms. So the uh, pain may radiate to the neck, jaw, shoulders, usually on the left side. And the pain can be described as tightness or heavy choking or strangling sensation. Okay. And here are more <clears throat> manifestations. Now, not all angina patients will have the same manifestations. Okay. It's unique to each person. Now, the these other manifestations, what do you think are responsible for this? Especially this part here after the as well as phrase, as well as shortness of breath, pallor, diaphoresis, dizziness, lightheadedness, lightheadedness, and nausea vomiting. What are responsible for these? They look familiar, yeah? We talked about this under shock and also under heart failure last semester. What's responsible for these manifestations? Because remember, what happens to the myocardial blood, blood flow during the chest pain? Decrease, right? So therefore, what happened to the contractility of the heart? Is it still as strong? No. So what happens to cardiac output? What happened, what is automatically triggered when cardiac output drops even just a little bit? Sympathetic and? and angiotensin or testosterone systems. That's what's responsible for these manifestations. Okay? All right. As described earlier, if this chest pain responds to rest or nitroglycerin, meaning if the patient after the chest pain comes on, rest, meaning they sit down or lay down, stop the activity, right? Meaning they don't continue with, let's say they were having sex. So they, they have chest pain. Will you continue and finish? Mm -hmm. uh, probably no, right? Yes, that's too scary. So stop, rest. And then, as I said, if they were already prescribed with nitroglycerin, they take nitroglycerin. So either rest or nitroglycerin, and the chest pain goes away, it is angina pectoris. Okay? That's the main characteristic of, of angina pectoris. So what uh, overall, what can we say again? It's the pattern of the pain. If you have angina, there is a precipitating event, right? Something happened and there was a stressor, a physical or emotional stressor. Chest pain comes on. And what does the pain look, pain uh, feel like? Okay, here, tightness, choking, and it radiates accompanied by these manifestations. 
And then what does the patient do? Rest. They rest or take a nitro. And what happens? The pain goes away or feels better, right? So that is angina pectoris. So therefore, if the patient's pain characteristics no longer meets those criteria, meaning let's say, look at this last paragraph. Unstable angina is characterized by attacks that increase in frequency and severity and, and are not relieved by rest and administration of uh, nitroglycerin. So is this, if, if the patient's pain is like this now, is it still angina pectoris? What do we call it now? It's now unstable angina. Are we clear? There any any um, um, ambiguity about this last paragraph, All right? So therefore, if I take <clears throat> um, nitroglycerin today, I have, I have chest pain, right? And I take, uh, they can also t uh, preemptively take uh, nitro, by the way, don't get me wrong. So let's say they're going to shovel snow, right? And they know, oh, I'm gonna have chest pain again once I start shoveling. So they can take, Nitro first, and then start shoveling. Okay, they can do that, right? Now, going back to the, why did that patient have angina pectoris again? What was the root cause? No, the root cause. How did they develop angina? I didn't say what precipitated it. So what, what caused them to have angina? No. It was the atherosclerosis, right? The atherosclerosis, right? They have CAD. Okay, so let's say the patient did not comply with the prevention. They continue to smoke, continue to eat, continue to have a sedentary lifestyle. Nothing, nothing happened. Uh, they're not doing anything to improve their, their condition. So what happens to the amount of plaque in the coronary, coronary artery? It would progress, right? It will get bigger. So eventually, Will they still have angina pectoris or will they have one or more of the acute coronary syndromes now? Now they'll have acute coronary syndromes. One of them is unstable angina, meaning as that atherosclerotic plaque gets worse and it get, gets narrower, the coronary vessel gets narrower and narrower. So now will it still be... Uh, will they still need a precipitating event before no. they get chest pain? No, no because one of these uh, days, the endothelial layer will rupture okay. and then cause a, a heart attack. All right? Okay. So it's already described here, unstable angina. This is one of the three acute coronary syndromes. <clears throat> so let's uh, proceed now. Uh, we'll discuss this one later because this will be mentioned again uh, later, they're the ACS uh, section. Uh, you know what? It's already mentioned here. So let's just start here. All right. So if the patient did not comply with the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatment, meaning did not <clears throat> manage their hypertension, did not manage diabetes, did not lose weight, did not stop smoking, so therefore, they now have a worsening of the CAD. So their CAD has progressed, it has advanced, probably affected multiple coronary vessels now. <clears throat> and so in order to uh, diagnose, uh, when the patient comes in with chest pain, uh, so let's say, let's look at uh, one scenario first, wherein I've had angina pectoris for a long time. Okay. So I've had it for maybe five years. Okay. But then I got older and I got lazier. Okay. So I'm not as active anymore. I'm taking the same dose of my medications, no changes. I haven't seen my doctor. Right. So okay. did my CAD now advance? Okay. So let's say this time when I, uh, I was shoveling snow or oh, chest pain, I took nitroglycerin and took a rest. I sat down, okay? I waited five minutes. There's usually, my pain goes away after five minutes. This time, it did not go away. What do I do next? 
Well, the answer is, is it angina pectoris? So therefore, what do I do? It's no longer angina pectoris because why is it no longer angina pectoris? It did not, it did not respond to rest or nitroglycerin. So now what do I do first? I have to call 911 first. And then while waiting for that ambulance to come, I can take a second and a third nitro. Are we clear? Yeah. All right. Why did we not, why didn't I finish the three before I called 911? Something else. Because it's not angina anymore, right? <clears throat> because before, when it was angina, it responded. I took nitro, it got better. I, I took a second nitro, it got even better, right? <clears throat> but this time, I took nitro, nothing happened. The pain persists. It did not improve at all. <clears throat> so is it angina pectoris? Not anymore. The characteristics aren't the same. So I have to call 911 because I know this is not angina pectoris anymore. It's something else. Okay. That something else is now acute coronary syndrome. Now let's call it ACS first because among the three, there are three acute coronary syndromes. We have angi unstable angina, then we have non-ST elevation MI, then we have ST elevation MI. The problem with these three is they all have chest pain, just like angina pectoris. However, unlike angina pectoris, wherein it was precipitated by a physical or emotional stressor and is relieved by rest and nitroglycerin, rest or nitroglycerin, this time they do not. Okay, the chest pain persists, meaning the chest pain came on with me just sitting on the couch, just laying down, doing nothing the chest pain started. So it is now acute coronary syndrome. Now, until they get to a facility that has a 12 lead ECG, we cannot tell which one of the three it is. Meaning, let me give you, let me explain it this way. So let's say Ms. Morley, Ms. Leah, and Stephanie all have chest pain, right? So let's say Morley has unstable angina, Leah has and, and STEMI, she has non-ST elevation MI. And then Stephanie has the, hit the jackpot, she has ST elevation MI. I cannot tell their chest pain apart. They look exactly the same. Okay, the, the chest pain, her chest pain complaint uh, for Morley, Leah, and Stephanie are exactly the same. How do I know which one you got? The only way to know is Two things. One, you have to get a 12 lead ECG and I have to draw blood for cardiac enzymes. Okay, that's the only way we can tell them apart. Any question? Okay, so you, why is it again called acute coronary syndrome? Yeah, we don't know. We don't know yet. Okay, we don't know which one of the three. And yes, you're right. The, the chest pain did not respond to rest and natural misery. But, but I mean, why didn't I automatically say, oh, you're, it's unstable angina? I can't say that because I don't have a 12 lead ECG. I don't have cardiac enzymes yet. I have to have this so that I can distinguish, so that the doctor can distinguish what do you exactly have. Okay, so until we get a ECG and we get your, your cardiac enzyme results, your diagnosis will remain acute coronary syndrome. Hey, I cannot, uh, the doctor can't tell for sure yet. So when you arrive in the ER, you have these chest pain episodes, initial diagnosis is acute coronary syndrome. I have to get a 12 lead ECG and I have to wait for the cardiac enzyme results. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. This ECG must be done within 10 minutes of arrival to the medical facility, whether it's a uh, urgent care center, uh, ER, or whatever, or, or even a doctor's office. So management, uh, these are the options. So depending on what type of diagnosis you have, the, uh, the goal is to restore blood flow to your myocardium, okay, to open up the artery and restore blood flow. The gold standard is PCI, 
this is the gold standard. We have to insert a catheter in the inferior uh, artery, you know, all the way to the coronary artery, and then open that obstructed um, coronary or coronary vessels. Another is uh, put a stent, okay? Uh, open it up, leave a stent, or if, if you have too many blood vessels that are diseased, then we'll have to do a bypass. Another option here, if let's say, unfortunately, you, you're in the middle of nowhere, so let's say you're in some godforsaken part of the Midwest, okay? So away from any advanced care facility. So let's say you arrive at a small hospital, or a county hospital, which has no, no cath lab. So they cannot do the PCI. So the only thing they can do to save you is to give you a thrombolytic. Okay, so to, to give you a, um, you know what a thrombolytic is? No, the place. Okay, so a clot buster. So this drug will dissolve the blood clot, or the one, the clot that was obstructing your uh, coronary arteries. Uh, however, that carries a lot of risk though. So we'll discuss shortly the, um, and there, not all patients are candidates for that procedure, because it, again, it's the thrombolytics are, are you know, dangerous medications. They, they, these can cause massive bleeding. So it's not, it's not for everybody. Okay, so let's go to the summary, uh, 20, table 23-2 for your medications. And, uh, uh, but please read especially the uh, rationales, okay, why, and then the details also, let's say for, let's start with nitroglycerin. Now nitroglycerin, which is number one here, table 23-2, uh, comes in different forms. There are short-acting and long-acting nitroglycerin. So the short acting are the ones you put under, under the tongue, spray under the tongue, or, um, uh, well, the patch isn't really short acting, uh, that's, that's long acting. If you have a, if you're on a patch right here, so if you read the detail, I won't read everything, uh, including the, of course, what's the, uh, what did you learn in pharmacology? What the side effect of when you take uh, nitro? This is the vasodilator, so you dilate everything. What will be the headache, right? Okay, so it will dilate, including the um, cerebral artery, so it causes a increased ICP, increased intracranial pressure, and causes a severe headache. So you can give them Tylenol for that. But for oral, right here, oral preparation, Oh, no, sorry, not oral, the patch, sorry. For patch, patch can be like literally a patch or it can also be an ointment. Uh, when it's an ointment, you you measure the, the ointment onto a paper, uh, one <laughs> inch long is usually one inch unless a doctor specifies only one inch long. Uh, so you, you squeeze the paste into the uh, one inch paper and apply it on the skin. So here's a warning. They're applied in the morning and removed at bedtime. I repeat, it's applied in the morning and removed at bedtime. Now, it depends on what your facility does. Because some facilities I've worked for, it shows up on the MAR in the morning as apply. Okay, so you have nitroglycerin for the day shift, and the action there is apply. And it shows up again at night. Instead of apply, it will say remove. Now, I've also worked for facilities wherein it just shows up on the day mark. It, nothing shows up on the night shift. So what will the night nurse do? We're supposed to remove it, but not all nurses will remember to do that. Okay, we have other things to do. So what happens now? The nitrate, the, the, the nitroglycerin patch or ointment stays on the patient, okay? especially if let's say the next morning, what if the next nurse uh, applies it on a different part of the body? So let's say the uh, nurse today put it on the right chest, 
Oh, no, sorry, right chest right here. And then the uh, night nurse did not remove it. Okay, just totally out of out of mind because it didn't appear on the mark. Then the next day, uh, another nurse came on for day shift. This time she um, applied it on the right thigh. Never saw the one on the right chest. Then the next that night, the nurse also did not did not remove anything. Then third day, the next nurse was on the left side of the patient. So now she puts it on the left chest. And then the next same thing happened third night, nurse also didn't remove. So fourth day, now the next nurse put it on the left thumb. Okay. And then the fifth day on the, you know, the right side again, then that nurse put it on the right arm. Okay. Then, so all this time, the patient's been having chest pain, blood pressure's high. Why? They develop tolerance to the nitroglycerin. So the nitroglycerin no longer works. Okay, so that's the rationale here. So you remove it. So 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Are we clear? So there's a 12-hour nitrate-free period. So the patient doesn't develop tolerance. Because otherwise, it won't work anymore. Okay, so how are you going to relieve the chest pain now? It won't work anymore. Because the patient developed tolerance, there's so much, so much nitroglycerin applied on the patient. So please always scan the entire body. Are we clear? So whenever you put a patch, just you, you can't, you know, you can't rely that everybody does their their job. These some nurses, you know, I mean, I'm not saying they did it on purpose, you know, just for thought. It, it happens. So not all you know shifts are the same. So if you have a crazy shift, you, you could you, um, you could forget that whole thing, right? Um, it should really be on the mar, okay? So it should that way we're rem reminded, okay? So uh, again, I've, se I've seen both uh, different facilities that have it, then some don't. So like the facility I work for now, it doesn't appear on the mark. So it, I'm I'm depending on the day shift nurse to tell me that they applied nitro. Because if they didn't, how would I know? So we use beta blockers. Now patients with, uh, especially if it's acute coronary syndrome, because remember there's deprivation of oxygen, right? So therefore some myocardial cells may die and therefore those dead uh, sections of the myocardium, of course, will become irritable and then cause uh, premature ventricular contractions. And they need uh, the, the only thing that will relieve that is uh, beta blockers. Uh, calcium channel blockers aren't really given during the uh, acute episode. We usually give the calcium channel blockers later when the um, chest acute episode is, is over, when the patient is stable. Okay, so we don't give the CCBs until then. Because this, look at look at the action of the drug. It's a calcium channel blocker. So it will it will disrupt the calcium channels. Okay, so it will cause dysrhythmias. So we don't give this during the acute episode. However, um, if they do, if the patients do not, here, if the patient do not respond to beta blockers, then this will be considered as an option. Okay, but Again, usually no. Uh, we don't really see that many patients that don't respond to beta blockers. Right? Beta blockers usually work all, um, almost all the time. Then we start antiplatelets. Remember, acute coronary syndrome is caused by a blood clot now. Okay? So you need to give aspirin and or clopidogrel. Uh, sometimes it's just one or the other, uh, but most patients will be on dual antiplatelet therapy. Unless there are bleeding uh, concerns, let's say this patient has a brain tumor, for instance, or let's say has a history of a gastric ulcer or something like that, then uh, just one or the other. But otherwise, none of those is bleeding concerns that put them on to them. Now, the purpose of anticoagulants here, as you see, Carl Shapiro is ordered a heparin, right? Infusion. Okay. So the reason for this is what happened again? with acute coronary syndrome, what formed on the surface of the endothelium? 
Yeah, so what happened to the plaque? It eventually ruptured, right? And then what formed on that ruptured layer? Clots. So platelets stuck to the area. And then once a platelet is, is activated, another will be activated, right? And then the next thing you know, there's an orgy of platelet there, right? Forming a big clot. Okay. So that's why we give heparin. So we place the patient on heparin because what's the action of heparin? Okay. Is it the same as antiplatelets? No. Antiplatelets only affect platelets. They cannot affect clotting factors. So antiplatelets have no action, no effect on clotting factors. Anticoagulants like heparin, however, will affect clotting factors now. So this will now prevent new clots from forming. Are we clear? So that, what about the existing clot? Because the existing clot is still there. The, the antiplatelet will only prevent new platelets from clumping together. Anti, anticoagulants will only prevent new clots from forming. There is an existing clot, so what happens to those? Okay, they will naturally be dissolved. Now, of course, we'll discuss later how big is the clot. Okay, so we'll, that will be determined by the patient's manifestations and the diagnosis. All right, so here, if the patient is having acute coronary syndromes, now, does it make sense wherein you keep giving the nitroglycerin sublingually? Because it's given every five minutes. So are you, you going to give it every five minutes for 24 hours? No, so it doesn't make sense, right? So that's why our limit is three doses. So after three doses, chest pain continues. doesn't make sense giving short-acting nitro. You give a continuous infusion now. So to control chest pain, that's why you're giving nitroglycerin. And what was the order for Shapiro? 40 micrograms per minute, right? And then you titrate that. Okay, you increase by how much? By five micrograms per minute every five minutes to control the chest pain. All right, so that's titration. So you calculate that, that's, it's okay because the once you figure out how much five micrograms per minute is, that's how much you add every five minutes okay, if the patient's chest pain gets worse. And it goes both ways. So if the patient's chest pain improves, of course, do you keep going up or do you start going down? You start going down, same increments, okay? Uh, warning for nitroglycerin, of course, is the blood pressure. So the parameter is if it's less than 90 millimeters of mercury systolic, then what do you do? Well, right. So hold it and then notify a physician. Because remember, we don't have um, uh, a prescribing authority. Okay? We can't prescribe stop the heparin, right? So you have to notify and get an order. Unless the order is already there. So if the doctor doesn't want to be uh, disturbed, then they should have a standing order what to do if the systolic blood pressure drops. Okay, So if, it, if that's the scenario, then you have to go call and get an order. As mentioned, headache is common. When, in whatever form of natural nutrient, whether it's sublingual, spray, IV, or patch, headache. Again, what's the rationale? Okay, dilates blood vessels, especially in the brain. So cerebral arteries dilate, it increases blood flow to the brain, increases ICP, causes a headache. Here's the rationale for your beta blockers. Okay, so we don't want the heart beating fast because remember, why would the heart, why would the patient have tachycardia during acute coronary syndrome? Sympathetic. It will automatically trigger sympathetic nervous system. So therefore, is it helpful? No, we need to suppress that because remember, there's already decreased blood flow to the myocardium. That's why the patient has chest pain. And what will automatically be triggered? sympathetic nervous system. So we need to stop that because otherwise, what will happen to oxygen demand? It will increase further. Okay, so beta blockers are your best friend. But always look at, again, just like nitroglycerin, what's, what do you check here? Blood pressure as well as heart rate now. So usually the parameter is heart rate less than 60, 
and SBP. Now, some drug books say SBP below 100, uh, but since we already have a parameter here for nitro, which is less than 90, uh, you can go with uh, less than 90 for uh, beta blockers as well, unless otherwise specified. Okay. Some doctors, if let's say the patient has both nitroglycerin and heparin, um, uh, no, sorry, nitroglycerin and beta blockers ordered, they, they put the uh, beta blocker parameter at 100. Uh, they, they say uh, hold below 100 because the patient's also receiving nitroglycerin. Now that's two drugs, okay? So they don't want the blood pressure to drop too much. Okay? Just now you have two drugs, one, uh, well, actually both um, beta blockers and nitroglycerin uh, affect um, afterload, yeah? yeah? So it... You have two drugs decreasing afterload, so that will drop the blood pressure too low. Mm -hmm. If you are doing these, if you are giving both, now avoid um, elevating the head of the bed too high. So usually we put the head of the bed around 10, okay? 10, 15 maybe, um, and instead in, uh, elevate the legs, okay? Just like in shock. All right, so here's a um, section on nitroglycerin. Now, since after this event, the patient goes home, the patient will be prescribed nitroglycerin. So here are your teaching. <clears throat> the first bullet emphasizes on the mouth because if it's sublingual, what works the absorption? In the mouth, right? Mm -hmm. Now for the tablet to dissolve, the mouth must be moist. But what happens during sympathetic nervous system stimulation? What happens to the mouth and mucous membrane? It dries up. So therefore, what should you, if you see the mouth is dry when you put the tablet under the tongue, what can you do? You can give 5 ml or a teaspoon of, of water, not to swallow, just to moisten the mouth. Okay, so just one teaspoon, just 5 ml. Just to moisten the mouth, that way the tablet will dissolve. Because otherwise, five minutes later, if that mouth is dry, the tablet is still whole. All right? So it has to be moistened if it is dry. Carry nitro everywhere. Uh, nitroglycerin will come in a brown glass vial. Tell the patient, because what do old people like to do? Put things in a... <laughs> Pill organizer, yeah? Okay, so don't do that because it will damage the nitroglycerin tablet. So they should be kept in a in its original uh, brown glass container. These are tiny tablets, by the way. So um, you should not take them out. It's just a small vial anyway. It'll fit in, a, in any purse, okay? So it'll fit in right there with your sandwich. Who put sandwich or purses in? Moms, I know moms will have a sandwich. Yeah. Carrying a, uh, nobody's carrying a purse. Yeah, see that purse right there? There's no reason that that purse is that big. I'm sure there's a sandwich in there. I would. Okay, um, here explain nitroglycerin is volatile, inactivated by heat. That's why it's in a brown glass container. It should be renewed every six months. But I haven't used it. It's a good thing you didn't use it. Okay? You didn't have to use it. So be thankful. Okay? Don't be stingy. It doesn't work anymore. I throw it away. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, or insurance will cover it anyway. No problem. Just, uh, I've never heard of a copay for atrobiscal. Um Right here, so before starting any activity, again, uh, physical or emotional stressor, take one, that's prophylactic. Okay, so the activities specified here are uh, exercise, stair climbing, sexual intercourse, uh, any angina producing activity. And then, so five minute intervals, five minutes each time. And then when do they call EMS? After the first. So here are your other side effects besides the headache. 
And of course, uh, rest or lay down uh, when you have the chest pain. So calcium channel blockers is an alternative to beta blockers. Aspirin and or Plavix, then heparin, and then finally nitro. Well, we did the nitroglycerin. All right, for the acronym of in which order you give these interventions, uh, the acronym is uh, MONA. Uh, you remember MONA, but the order is actually ONAM. Okay, so oxygen first. So let's say a patient comes into the ER, oxygen is applied because the patient has chest pain and short, is short of breath. So oxygen followed by nitroglycerin and then aspirin, unless the patient already received aspirin from the EMT. Okay, so aspirin and then morphine. Morphine is for the chest pain. Now, Another reason for the morphine is actually reducing myocardial oxygen demand because morphine is a CNS depressant. So it will relax the patient, slow everything down, and that helps reduce myocardial oxygen demand uh, on top of the pain relief also. <clears throat> Here's a reminder on your uh, pain assessment. Remember, we learned pain last semester. So don't just stick with, because I know students always ask, how bad is the pain, right? And then don't even bother with yeah. right, the PQRST. So make sure your pain assessment is complete. So description, location, intensity. So the severity is only one assessment. Okay, so how bad is it? That's only one aspect. Don't forget the location description, uh, what makes it better, what makes it worse, what is its effect on your um, on body fun on your um, activity. Okay, this part here is they're um, repeating what we already discussed. Uh, just emphasis on the Position, again, the patient, I know the patient has shortness of breath, but always base your positioning on the blood pressure, especially when you start giving the meds already. So if the blood pressure is below 90, can you elevate to semi -pallor? Okay, so you drop to 10 or 15 and then raise the legs. legs. We already discussed the 12 lead ECG uh, taken within how long? 10. 10 minutes from arrival. Now, when you read the interventions here under nursing interventions, uh, I know the um, order is ONAM, yeah? So stick with ONAM because in the statements here, in the paragraph, <clears throat> let's say here, they start nitroglycerin and then talk about oxygen later. Okay? So it should be oxygen first. So reducing anxiety, reassure the patient. This is a scary event okay, for anybody, whether or not you have something to lose. It's scary. Uh, pain prevention, you have two interventions here for uh, Mr. Shapiro. What is uh, ordered for Mr. Shapiro? Beside morphine, you have nitroglycerin also, for either one of those. Uh, aspirin, is it for pain? Okay, so aspirin is no longer for pain, all right? Mm -hmm. So the only ones, the only people who still say aspirin are the baby boomers, right? Those are the, the generation that took aspirin for pain. All of us here now, are you taking aspirin for pain? Yeah. No, you go for Tylenol and ibuprofen. Yeah, no, you're you an uh, old soul. Okay? <laughs> so no, do not take aspirin anymore. Okay, aspirin is only for Right, right. If you have an MI, okay, uh, let's say atherosclerosis. Once you have CAD, you'll be prescribed aspirin. And here's your teaching. So for angina pectoris, uh, same thing, because this is usually uh, about nitroglycerin. So go back to the nitroglycerin chart. Any questions?
Okay, let's take a short break, come back at 2.40.